Okay, let me start off at this end. I got, I got the cheap end here. Okay. Uh, back in 1970, while stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia, or Benning School for Boys, as we used to call it, uh, I was introduced to the Starlight Scope. And while it was a neat item and everything else, they told us they cost, I don't know, like three or $5,000 a piece. So I really didn't expect to ever get any de devices like that. And we were given a course called STANO, S-T-A-N-O, Surveillance, Target Acquisition, and Nighttime Observation. All right. So there we were in STANO classes. Uh, about four or five years later, I was at a gun shop watching sporting goods. And the guy behind the counter goes, I know you're into M1 carbines. He says, well, I got this Cuban guy who's given up on trying to replace Castro. And he's selling off his collection. And he had a stoner, 63, 180, whatever it was, and uh, an M1 carbine. And he goes, and I even got a night scope, you know. And it was some ridiculously low price because God knows if it would work, right? So I'm going to do what's called Generation Zero, okay? And that was the technology of the Second World War. And from what I understand, the British had done some experiments, you said, in the 1930s? I remember, I think it was 1926. Okay. I don't want to steal your thunder for it. Yeah. Okay? And they had given up on it. And uh, the Germans decided they'd play around with it. So the Americans had to mess around with it. And it's an IR or infrared system. All right? You have to send out an infrared beam, and you got to be able to look at it through the scope. And it was a heavy, it added like 25 or 30 pounds to an M1 carbine. Now, why the M1 carbine? Because if you put it on an O3 Springfield or an M1 or anything else, the recoil and everything else will probably knock it out. Plus, the range of the infrared system, like this, was going to only be about 75 yards, okay? Now this is the snooper scope. It's mounted on this handle, and you would then start the beam, infrared, or you would actually light this up first and make sure nobody else is out there doing infrared. And then you would put this on, and you could see people walking around maybe 75 yards away. This particular one worked for me about 40 years ago. I haven't tried it since. Okay? Uh, a buddy of mine took 8 volt batteries, wired them up somehow to the transformer, which brings it up to a 20,000 volts or something, something weird thing. Something crazy like that. Something crazy like that. And, you know, we were playing around with it. And I did some more research. And the only place that I can find where they were actually used was Okinawa. And they had 300 of these units were sent out to the American Army there to get Japanese infiltrators. That's what they were looking for. And again, an M1 carbine is not a frontline weapon, but for 75 to 100 yards, you can hurt people. Also, they would give the, some of the guys with carbine tracer rounds. And what they would do is if they found a group of Japanese soldiers trying to get their way in, they'd fire tracer rounds into the crowd and then somebody would open up with a machine gun, okay? But they found it very, very effective for stopping and, you know, identifying Japanese infiltrators, which was always a problem. That was part of Japanese infantry battle doctrine was at night, you send in infiltrators, you try to knock out the American guards or get past them, and when the main attack starts, you cause all kind of ruckus in the rear area, okay? So... It had value. There was a special mount that you can put on an M1 carbine that's in this cruddy box. And you can put it on any M1 or M2 carbine. Uh, they were also used in Korea. Okay? And guess what? After Korea, it was old technology. And that's when I'm going to pass it over to the man who really knows the neat shit. Joel. All right. So obviously my interests tend to be a little more <coughs> current, given that's what people are looking to buy. Uh, as some guy who's you know, sitting in his garage fixing this stuff, selling it, custom builds, whatever you like, I do it all. Uh, that tends to be where my interest lies. But he is correct. This right here is the only real usage in World War II other than on tanks. 
The Germans were the first to really acknowledge that this was a useful thing, and they started using it on tanks. The problem is you have this giant freaking emitter. So everybody else went, why do we need to build the whole device? Why do we have to see in the dark if we can just check if somebody's looking at us? And that's it. You know, it's way cheaper to build something to look and see that emitter than it is to actually see. And that kind of nixed the whole program. The British were the ones to invent it. They never used it. We used it in this one place. It was a fact the Germans drew up. Things kind of get a little more interesting 30 years later. In the Vietnam era, so we have right at the peak of Vietnam in the like 1970, 1972, the Starlight Scope comes out. This one does not work because I cannot find parts for it. There are not that many of them out there. Unfortunate, but that's your Generation 1. I have brought this one along too. This is also a Generation 1. This is from the 90s when the Soviet Union falls apart. They are using one tube and one tube exclusively. You still see it today in Ukraine because they just have so many of them. It's a Generation 1 tube. It's terrible. There's one in here. I feel terrible for the guys on the front using these today, but I can't help them and they're not on my side. So. Things are 19, late 70s, early 80s. <coughs> Dan over here can tell us a little more if he'd like. But yeah, 70s. 70s? 70? Yeah. So we get to our Generation 2. The big difference here, I'm going to hold up a diagram here, hope everybody can see, is they add this centerpiece here. It's called a micro channel plate. The way this whole device works, the entire core of it, we have a charge screen on the front, we have a micro channel plate in the center, and we have a phosphor, literally phosphorus or phosphor, across the back there. So what happens is your photons will strike that front plate, they get converted to electrons that shoot out the back. Micro channel plate in the center amplifies those electrons so that you go from like 1 to 10 or 20 or what it's, I think it's thousands now. But, and then that strikes the phosphor and generates an image. That's why it's green. The phosphorus lights up green, kind of like neon. I'm sure you've all seen the neon light in your time. Generation 2 is good, but Generation 2 suffers a number of problems. It's not very sensitive to light. It's far better than anything before it, but it also suffers particularly over long periods of time. The older they are, the more use they've seen, the worse they get. They quite literally burn out. The screens get worse and worse as time goes on. I've got the guts. I've got tubes. I've got guts. These are all broken. If you'd like to play with them after the show, feel free. I won't mind. I do rebuild these. I'll take the broken ones, pull them apart for all the pieces. I use a vacuum chamber to pull all of the gas bubbles out of the epoxy, because as he mentioned, when you get to like five, 10,000 volts, that electricity arcs. And you gotta keep the arcs from happening. Electronics don't like that so much. This is where we get into the more modern day. So I think this one is stamped like, there it is, March 1990. This is a PBS7A. The A model was, I debate to be the better one, but it was not the one that the Army bought a gajillion of. The Army bought a gajillion, and you'll still see these out there. I'm sure that the poor privates out there today in the field are still using them. PBS 7B slash D. They work great. It's a Gen 3 device. I think they're wonderful. Lots of work's been done with them. Very popular. People buy a lot of those because they're a much more reasonably priced type deal. And things from here, it's all Gen 3 out. Uh, there is a little discussion, or was, I suppose, but Generation 4, there is no such thing. If anyone tries to tell you that there is, don't, don't believe them. It doesn't exist. It's just a slow continuation of the technology that is the third generation, which if I, the diagram is exactly the same for Gen 3. They've just gotten better gases inside, so it's more sensitive, better resolutions on the actual image. It's exactly like a TV resolution. You know how you have different TV resolutions? It's a higher resolution screen. From here on out, these all use almost exclusively the same tube. It's, I mean, we're talking like, you know, early 2000, 1990, no, late 90s, early 2000s, to this day, it is the exact same format tube. The new ones are a little better. Some of them are now white instead of green. But from a physical standpoint perspective, they're almost identical. Uh, I obviously the technical changes a little bit, but you, you could, in theory, just start swapping them out. It's totally doable. I clearly do it. I can teach you how if you got a broken one, it's not so bad. This is more of a, uh, I guess here we'll say, USB or ROM. These were, this is a PBS 17. This is probably the only time you're ever going to see one. They're really not that common. It is a Gen 3 scope. We're going to play with it later. 
It is, I think, two and a half times magnification, something like that. It's a very low magnification with just one red dot in the center. And it works great. They sent them primarily, I think, for your rock, actually, during the invasion of your rock. This was like the big cutting edge stuff. And additionally, you probably would have had a PBS 14 for the one eyed usage. On a helmet like this, with a little rhino arm, you literally just slap it up and down on your head. Real easy to use. PBS 14, Gen 3, very straightforward. Nice diagram if you want to see how one of those tubes works. But the big thing these days is they've moved away from these PBS 7s and 14s. The downside to a 14 is only one eye can see in the dark. Seems kind of obvious. The advantage is now if there is a little bit of light, you still have depth perception, right? Unfortunately, when you have a device like this that splits the same image into two eyes, there is no depth perception. You can't, you can't tell depths distances, which is particularly difficult for things like driving, can be a really big problem. If you can't tell how far away the cliff is, you better not drive towards it. Walking through the jungle. Walking through the oh man, you're going to trip over everything. It can be done, again, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's definitely obsolescent. Not obsolete, but obsolescent. They're now moving to these dual tube setups. I have here the first, I guess, army issued version. PBS 15, two eyes, pretty straightforward. If somebody offers you one of these, they're neat, but the problem is you can't get parts. They don't use common parts like all the others. The tubes are the same, but the lenses and housings are totally different. So most people will buy a commercial model, something like this, which uses standard lenses, standard tubes, very easy to work on because it is all standard parts. I'm a big fan. I used to use those, actually. And the current model, which we're issuing, is the 31s which is this neat thing where the eyes go up, so you know you can flip them up and down as necessary. Which is good because you can get them out of your face really quick if you need to look at something close up especially. Right? If you're trying to read a map, it's really hard to read a map with night vision. <coughs> kind of a common problem, I guess you'd say. I've got some illuminators, glow sticks actually. This is an infrared glow stick. It looks like a glow stick. I've got a dozen of these things, I can just open one up, right? It looks like a glow stick, but you can't see it glowing with your eyes because it's infrared light. <coughs> I've got an MS-2000 marker, which is a classic. I don't really... It flashes. That's all it yep. does. Flashes <laughs> infrared light. That's all it does. So you slap it on your helmet or something, and now the guy in the helicopter above you can tell it's you and not the bad guys. Because the bad guys, luckily for the last 20 years, have not had night vision, so they can't see infrared light. So every time you mark yourself with an infrared light, all your friends know who you are. Bad guys don't see it, though. For most of this stuff, other than the scopes, there are two ways to aim when you're using night vision on your face. There's really only two ways. The first one is passive aiming. Passive aiming means you need to have an optic, like a red dot or a holographic, something like that, which is night vision compatible. All this means is that it's not that bright. It drops the image, that brightness of that dot down real far. So you don't blind yourself when you're looking through it. Not that you're actually going to blind yourself, but the image washes out. Technical. Doesn't matter. That's a myth I want to cover. I should have mentioned from the beginning. I am sorry not to bring that up. No, you cannot be blinded while you're wearing these things. Everybody believes this. I don't know why. If you look at a bright light, the image just turns green. That's it. You're not going to be blinded. Whereas passive aiming, I'm losing myself here. Passive aiming is good. Passive aiming means that they can't tell that you're aiming at them, even if they're wearing night vision, which is great and is kind of modern. But previous to that, it was all lasers. These are, I think these are actually both. These are uh, Russian purses. You can't get them anymore because the Russians are, uh, let's just say, no longer exporting them. They're kind of desperate for them. It is exactly what you're when you see in the movies, right? You're, Looking through the night vision, they got the lasers going back and forth. That is exactly what it looks like. It's an invisible laser nobody else but night vision users can see. They're great, they work wonderful, big fan, obviously. And that is active aiming, I guess. Yeah, passive and active, there we go. So there's been a variety of helmets, it doesn't really matter. As I've said, a lot of people will tell you that helmets matter, they do. You're going to want to counterweight. This is a big heavy thing hanging up in front of your face. You're going to hurt your neck if you don't have a heavy thing in the back to counterweight. And yeah, that's kind of the core, I guess. I'm trying to think what else. I didn't really prepare a speech because 
I kind of wanted a question and answers. I figured it'd be easier on everybody. Have we got questions. The big one. The big one. Yeah. Which one? <laughs> the biggest. Oh, the monstrosity. Yeah. Sometimes I put it on an M16 carry handle just because it looks funny. <laughs> it weighs about the same as the rifle. It is a TVS5. It is a direct descendant of the four. You can see they're really the same. Same rear lens, same housing, same tube. But this is a four time magnification and that's a seven. And that's a big distinction in weight. So again, if you put it on an M16, really good for fighting Soviets on the moon. That was a joke that did not land. <laughs> <laughs> I remember running around with four in an hour. I don't know. Training yeah. operations in the, in the northern training area. How well did it work? It worked extremely well. Okay. Believe it or not. Okay. Um, and then even with the night vision that we had then, and that's why I made a comment about walking through the jungle, you immediately lose your depth perception. So you cannot tell how deep a hole is. So you end up doing this wacky slow motion dance <laughs> as you are moving because you are trying to touch your foot down because you don't know how deep it's going to go. So you really do move in a whack, at least you used to, at one when with that early, and I'm talking, this is the early 90s. Oh, you're still doing it with all of yes, where I'm. This is early 90s, so that's the technology. I mean, you had that wacky move to. It's exactly the same. It has for, that was really my question. Yeah. Have yeah. they finally figured out well, that Well, if, if, if only what I can see, well, yeah. not much has changed. Yeah. They're still using 7s and 14s. This is still what the Army is, I don't know, a gajillion of them. They're, they're everywhere. They're out there and they're everywhere. Some of these are previously military tubes which are now in civilian hands, I guess you'd say. Uh, that's kind of a separate touchy topic that we won't go into. You can find this stuff on eBay, though. Uh, yeah, you're right. You should try walking up and down stairs when only one eye can see. It is quite a challenge. Yeah. Any other particular questions? Dying? Yeah, on the 14th, you ran out of one eye. Can you explain how that's tiny? You walk around like this, you got one eye wide open like this, and you got one eye with the big night vision. It's kind of weird. It's uh, and it's good because you know you keep your uh, your night normal night vision. I get it, I get it, but I kind of like the uh, I, I didn't like the dual thing there. It's kind of unbalanced to me. That's your personal taste, and a lot of guys would uh, revert to the older uh, set. But if you see it mounted on a head, you just see it's kind of weird having just one one eye on. And I, 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 you know, they're both good. They're both good. It's. It's kind of interesting with the one eye. I wasn't crazy about it. Some people like it better than others. Yeah. I think that the 14, having played with it, was, God. You get used to what you get issues to. You, it's not just that you get used to it, but man, it hurts the brain. One eye is just totally wide open and can't see anything. It's, it, it hurts my brain. I don't know. Call me a, call me a. I was that time I was. Yeah. I mean, it literally does just click out of the front. That's it. Cyclops, yes. In states like Texas, where you can hunt hogs at night. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you heard anything from them? Which vision devices they prefer? Or, or everybody's using duals. That's that's <laughs> just the modern way to go. If you've got the money, it's always duals. I argue that white phosphorus is not worth it. I'm sure that it's the new big hot thing. It has been for the last five or ten years, but uh, it's like double the price, and you're getting the same performance. So I mean, I guess it looks nicer and it's a little easier on the eyes, but I don't think it's personally worth it. Personal opinions. What stack are going to run you if you were going to go buy a set now? Uh, sevens go for like somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred, depending on the grade of tube inside. Okay. Uh, there have been advances since the nineties when they really came out and around. Uh, I argue that the last, I guess, the last run, uh, like the Omni Seven series, because they are the government bought them in omnibus contracts, so they just refer to it as Omni. Omni 1, Omni 2, and every few years there'll be a new one. I think in like 2007 or something, it was the last line of the PBS7 tubes. I argue they are the best because they feature all of the modern features that are auto-gated, they're thin film, they're the whole thing, and you can get one for like 1500 bucks, 1400 bucks, which is significantly less than the like $5,000 you pay for a pair of duels. Okay. And a lot of the same performance. So. For all intents and purposes, I'd say it's good enough, and it's a really good entry point. 
Any word of okay, police use in the United States, which ones are popular? Or? I have sold a number of these to police, uh, usually for their personal or on-the-job use or whatever they call it. Uh, they like all of it. It's useful because, again, you can see in the dark without being seen, yeah. which is a nice element. It's good for all sorts of surveillance stuff. I didn't bring any of the like surveillance type units. Yeah. Uh, they have these huge zoom lenses on the stuff on front, so you can sit a few buildings over and still look in the dark. But they're popular. I can't say as to whether it's an effective usage of your money as a police officer, <coughs> but it is definitely something which could be useful. Yeah. The M2 scope that I have there, the person that fixed it for me was a police officer, and then he borrowed it, and he used it to catch teens hiding in the woods all the time. And he, he loved it because they couldn't figure out how he knew where they were. Yeah. And um, yeah, he they only had a range of like 50 or 60 yards. But effective uh, range. Yeah, you know, effective range. Yeah. But of course, the other thing that caught a lot of those kids is they used to wear those sneakers that light up every time you step down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lights oh, produce shoot. these huge halos. You're welcome to play with these later. I brought batteries so you can give them a try if you'd like. Yeah, lights produce haloing, which is one of the big values you measure in this. I mean, there's, it's a huge technical sheet of data for performance, I guess you'd say. And it's exactly one of the values measured is halo. Does a light source, how large a ring of white light does that light source produce? And you're right, if you've got little sneakers with it, oh, you're going to see it real quick, real quick. Any idea like where the Chinese are in their night vision technology? All right, so the Chinese have an interesting thing going on. Uh, they have a preference right now for the quote unquote general issue, which isn't really general at all because, again, they don't have the money to issue this stuff. They're really banking on a lot of digital equipment. Digital is not good. I'm going to leave it at that. If you see something cheap, it is probably not good. Uh, the Chinese are right now using something which is about $300 or $400. Uh, it's okay-ish. I'd call it down to about Gen 2 over there. But, uh, that's their most popular stuff. The Chinese are on a small scale producing knockoff Photonis tubes. Photonis is a French company. They make what they call Gen 2 Plus. It's good. If you're buying proper Photonis tubes, they're pretty solid. They're not the best, but they're pretty good. They're going to suffer in super low light conditions. Right? If you're in the middle of the woods and there, it's a moonless night, you're going to be totally blind with these uh, European tubes. But the Chinese have a factory which is currently spewing out basically a knockoff of those. It's okay in most conditions. It's not going to be good in really dark environments. That's where Gen 3 really stands out. When you're saying tubes, what exactly do you mean? I mean a literal tube. It is a vacuum tube. It is a vacuum tube. That's what this diagram is. You can see we've got, so that's going to be the front, right? So that's the, which I'm holding it backwards, right? So this front plate, that's your positively charged, I think it's actually negatively charged, it doesn't really matter. It's a charged plate. Your photons strike that plate, they generate electrons out the back, which shoot down, down the length of the tube. In the center here, we have a microchannel plate, which literally looks like a honeycomb type thing, and they bounce around, generates more electrons, comes out the bag to a phosphorus thing. It is literally a tube. It is analog technology as it gets. Vacuum tube and all. Fancy power supply bits wrap around it, but in the end, what I stick in these, it is a tube. They got smaller, they got better, but it is an analog technology through and through. Hit me. All right. Uh, how do they protect themselves from being burnt out by bright lights? And when did that technology come around? So that technology starts to appear, well, starts to appear better in the later Gen 3 stuff. The Gen 2 stuff, if you look at a bright light, it's pretty easy to scar the thing. You, it'll literally look like a black burn across the image from a bright light. It's particularly famous for happening with lasers. It's very bright light. Bright lights will burn them. It literally burns out that phosphor, <coughs> that, uh, that phosphor plate literally burns it out. So that part of the image becomes unusable. I don't think I have any good examples of damaged tubes with me here today, but that is an irreparable thing. You cannot fix it. 
To help protect it, I have more to the point. To help protect against this, the tube is actually flickering insanely fast, you know, a thousand times a second or whatever. And it's going to alter that speed depending on how bright the thing it's looking at is. So to help protect it, it'll drop down the, the number of flashes per second, which helps. But again, it's not going to be the be all and everything. You can still burn. Uh, their enemy is bright lights and being dropped. That's the two things that kill them. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, good old stories at Fort Benning uh, in 1970, you know, they told us outright, they said there's a $3 tube in there, and if the light goes on and that tube doesn't work, you'll lose your eyesight. That was the, the story we were told. They lied to you that in the early 90s, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, and the reason for it is that we don't want private schmuck to tell you destroying a $2,000 equipment. So we're just going to come and say burn out his eyes. <laughs> That's it, yeah, yeah. That may actually be where that whole thing comes from. Yeah. The uh, bright lights are going to blind you now. It, it won't, but it will destroy the tube very quickly. And that's more what the government was concerned about was breaking. We don't care about your eyes. <laughs> oh, no, not We'll at all. get in your fry. Oh, God. Yeah, there, there was actually, there you go, there's an interesting thing. So especially on the older ones, the, I guess, Gen 1 stuff, you'll see this has this green cap on the back, which isn't actually a cap. It's just an extra screw-on piece of glass. Uh, rumor has it that this is all because the troops got upset thinking that they were going to like get radi irradiated eyeballs or something staring into this thing. So they put some leaded glass. Whether it is or isn't, I can't say, but it sounds like a rumor to me. Here's your leaded glass. Yeah, yeah, it's you're totally safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that like the Russian anti-radiation? Yes, yeah, yeah, it's Russian exactly like that. Yeah, take this. Don't read the side that says Hallow. Just yeah, take yeah, yeah, just take it. Stop. Placebo. Placebo, yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite, even. All right. Any other so, questions? Uh, yeah, where is this going in the future? Where is this going in the future? So that is a tough debate right now. Uh, currently, we are, I'm not going to say we're at the peak. The resolutions on the images are getting better. They're getting more sensitive to light. They're getting, you know, better at withstanding bright light, stuff like that. The, the halo values, the actual, it, it, it's hard to describe. It's like a halo around bright lights, right? Any you know, Christmas lights in the, difference in the distance produce this big white lump around the actual sources of the light. That value is getting better, stuff like that. It is a continual, gradual improvement. What's it going to look like in 10 years? I don't know. Maybe they'll come up with something slightly better in the analog technology. It always is creeping that way. But the question is, where is digital going to go? Well, is this forever analog? This is all analog, yeah. All the way to this day, it is analog. The question is whether digital is going to strike it big. And I think yes, but it's going to be some time. I don't think we're there yet. And if you're looking to go out and buy in the next 20 years, I don't think you're looking in the right place. At the you see these telescopic sites advertised now for yeah. like 800 bucks. Yeah. Uh, hunting hogs is probably pretty low tech. Hunting hogs is pretty low tech. I mean, like, I see people hunting hogs with 7s and 14s and all sorts of stuff here. All that stuff. What is analog? Oh boy, analog versus digital? Uh, that's a complicated question, but... Oh, analog. Yeah, analog is... There's no digital processing. There's no computer and chips, no nothing like that. I mean, not really. The power supplies in them do have some processing. I guess that's analog. Yeah, that's analog right there. Uh, it's, it's the same debate, you know, digital computers versus analog computers. It's transistors, I guess you'd say, transistors. The analog is an actual image that's coming through it. Yes. The digital would be a generated image. Yes. That's so that would right. be a primary difference. Yeah. Yeah, this is, not, this is not generating an image with computer processing. There's nothing like that. Are there, are there any paintball games that they use this? Absolutely. Oh my God, yes. I Like a quarter of my clientele who buy these things are out there playing paintball, airsoft, whatever. Somebody hit me in the glass with a paintball this. But they're how many thousands of dollars? They sell these lovely little clear plastic pieces. You just put it over the front of the lens there. Totally fine. All right. <laughs> make, your, make your $12 investment, trust me. Yeah, I'm about to say, whoa, wait, hold on here. <laughs> oh God. Probably one kid had it. And then, then everybody oh, everybody's buying them now, yeah. We're yeah. talking about probably wasn't his night vision, it was dad's night vision. Oh, God. 
Poor kid. <laughs> Poor kid. These right. pairs are not cheap. How about the quads? Everybody sees so oh, God. Got the quads. Quads. I'm sure you've quads seen them. With, with the four lenses, I'm sure you've seen them. Yeah. What? Yeah. What is the deal with them? Uh, they're really... Oh, they're cool as hell, and if I could afford one, I would probably not buy one, because, you know, it's unnecessary. There are two models out there. One of which you see in all the movies, and they, they're probably not real for the movies, but who's kidding me, it doesn't matter. Uh, you'll see one model. The one that was long forgotten that came out about 10 years ago was the Anvis 10, which was specifically for, like, pilots, mostly. I was going to say like fighter pilots, but they could. It's mostly helicopter pilots. It gives you a larger field of view. These all limit you to about a 20 degree field of view, so you kind of make a circle in front of your face, and that's what you're looking through. Those give you something closer to like 80, so you get a wider field of view, which is nice until you realize that you still have something that's now twice as heavy hanging off the front of your face. It needs twice the batteries. It's not that big an improvement. You got four things to go wrong. And you got four things that could go wrong now. Yeah. And one of the points of interest was, what's his name, O'Neill, who shot Bin Laden. You know, they went on the raid with the quads. He kept his tools. He says, I don't want to play with these things. I want something I'm used to, kind of like me with the sets. And so. And I totally agree. I, I sometimes get that question, you know, if I use sevens in the army, should I buy duels? You could. I'm not going to say no. It is definitely a step up, but there is something to be said for sticking with what you know. And it is cheaper, so. All depends what you're looking to do, I guess. I was just thinking about it. If you remember, like, the movie uh, Zero Dark Thirty, when you see him keep picking them up and walking on and talking and stuff like that, you do that a lot. You go to White Light when you get inside, so, you know, it's not like you're going to live on these things for forever. You're going to be having them on and off. So it's kind of... The old there's, flashlight still works, too, you know? Yeah, there's, there's two types of arms that hold these things on the helmet. And the Army was very popular and really loves the, what they call, push to overcome where you just slap the whole thing upwards. There's no buttons, there's no releases, nothing like that. And I kind of like that because there's no thinking, oh, I want it off my face, okay, done. There's no need to stop and push a button and then manipulate it. I don't like that person. I always had trouble at night with buttons. I love that. I love that. <sighs> You're standing there with this thing on your face, where's the freaking button, you can't find it. I'm not a fan of that, I'm not a fan of that. What's the battery life for the night vision? You're going to get all night out of your battery, so you don't even need to worry about it. There are uh, larger helmet packs. They go on the back of the helmet there. Battery packs for the helmet. Uh, popular for helicopter pilots because, again, you're going to be sitting in that seat for like, maybe hours. Uh, realistically, with a, two AA's and a PVS-7, and it is AA batteries, the same ones that you've always known, uh, you're going to get like eight hours, ten hours, no problem. Maybe more. Yeah, they are very efficient. Are these traditional lenses that they use? And is there one or two manufacturers who makes most of those lenses and sells them? Or is everyone to make their own? All right, so that's a really good question. There are definitely preferences in lenses. The current all the rage is the American company Carson. Uh, they've always been traditionally excellent. I like Carson lenses on my set over here. They're good clarity, good coatings, good quality. There are, Rochester Precision also makes some. They're popular, but I don't own any. There are other companies that make them. There are Japanese ones, there are Taiwan ones. A lot of them are very good. Do not buy the Chinese ones. The Chinese ones are, again, not great. They're cheap for a reason. So. I just thought of an interesting thing. Um, these things need some kind of light to generate. They yes. The moon, the stars. If it's pitch black, you just see a green. You see nothing. You see nothing. And the bad guys probably know by now that the, the U.S. Army, when like, they're overseas, it's like, you know, you get the full moon, then it gets down to a half moon, then it gets down and less and less. The military has like to do night operations and they have at least a half moon. So you'll have like half a month where the pilots are happy to go out and do insertion and do strikes, and you plan your missions around that. Unless it's something super, super important and see guys coming in from Pakistan, you got nailed that night. So they only operate half the time. Because they need that, they need that light source. Another interesting thing is, I think this was done like way before it. We call them Muslim wars. Was uh, that there's no ambient light to light these things up. You can take like on a base, you can say searchlights just shine into the sky. That and works that very down. well. And then they, yeah. you know, and that works. So interesting how you get around stuff. But the other thing, you can, both of you guys were talking about the super scope mm -hmm. and standing. You're saying in Okinawa. Yeah. I said like a third of the Japanese killed at night on Okinawa. Right, these things really it was very, very, very end of the war. It was a 
big, big hit as crappy as they are. I really did work on that. The Germans did try some similar stuff for the uh, STG-44. They did have a you know, rifle-mounted night vision optic. But again, when you're, when you're lug lugging around all of this, this is tough and expensive stuff to make, and they're already losing the war. So you can imagine there, there really aren't many surviving examples. Like, there's like one or two of them out there, but there's certainly none in private hands that I'm aware of. You've got to tell them the name of it. Come on. Oh, God. The vampire. That's it. Or the vampire, yeah. right? The vampire. Vampire, whatever, however the Germans say that. Yeah, that's the one. He did make a good point, though, there. If you're in, like, a pitch black space, I mean, you, you're, you're in a basement with no light whatsoever, they will not work, which is kind of a problem. So most of them come equipped with an illuminator. It is literally just a tiny, li tiny little infrared LED. There's one here. This one's got one right in the side, right there. The 7 has one. It is, that's the illuminator. That's the highlight cutoff. So there is actually built into some of these devices. The 7 has it. The 14 has it. Because, again, you're issuing these to you know, private schmuckatelli. If it's in a room with light on, it'll turn itself off after about a minute, which is good for private schmuckatelli, but may not work in your favor otherwise. A lot of the modern stuff doesn't have it. Wouldn't you throw a glow stick or something? You could. You could totally throw one of these into a dark room and produce light. Yeah. And it'll work then, absolutely. But you you have one built into your face, so why not use it? Further questions? I got it. All right. All right. You guys have to turn the lights off and play with them, huh? <laughs>